Sri Lanka, 2009. The president of Sri Lanka at the time started pushing to build a new port in a small town at the south end of Sri Lanka. Why? Because ambitious projects like this that promise prosperity make you look like a good, caring politician. The only problem was that everyone including their own government studies estimated that the port wouldn't be profitable. And when they went to their neighboring Indian companies for funding and construction, even they said the same thing. It was an economic dud then, and it's an economic dud now. But then the president announced that the project had been greenlighted, with the help of none other than China. The Chinese government's Export-Import Bank gave them a loan of $307 million. On the surface, this looked very generous. We're helping a developing country build infrastructure when other selfish countries wouldn't help. But it came with some clever terms. The port would have to be built by the CCP's preferred company, China Harbor, so that it looks like money is going to this developing country, but then it just gets funneled back right into the Chinese economy. So there's really no risk to the Chinese government and only upside. And another requirement was that Sri Lanka would be required to let the Chinese government know exactly who is coming in and out of the port. So they also get valuable intel on top of everything. The port opened in 2012 and the forecasts were right. No one was interested in this new port. With only 34 ships docking there in 2012 compared to nearly 4,000 ships at Sri Lanka's other port, Colombo. And its finances were in the hole. So the president went back to China for another loan, this time for $757 million. China agreed, but with the condition that the first loan of $307 million would go from a 1-2% to interest rate to a 6.3% interest rate. A very steep hike. Then a new Sri Lankan president was elected and took over a country shackled in debt. Debt had increased three times to 44.8 billion, and by the end of 2015, they had a 4.7 billion dollar payment due, money that they didn't have. So what did they do? They took out another loan from China, this time for 1 billion dollars to help pay off that upcoming debt payment. The equivalent of you taking out a loan to help pay off your monthly credit card statements. Or in other words, it's safe to say that Sri Lanka found itself at the mercy of the Chinese government. Not at the point of a gun or at the crack of a whip, but through the double-edged sword of debt. It was drowning in debt payments and was left with an expensive port no one wanted to use. Their only option? Go to the negotiation table and hope that China would show some mercy and let them cancel some of this debt. Yeah, that didn't happen. And now China owns 85% of that port and managed to squeeze 15,000 acres of land around that port as well, which adds just one more strategic infrastructure project in China's growing portfolio around the globe. And where does China have their eyes set on now? Africa. The fascinating math behind macroeconomics drives some of the biggest decisions that affect our lives. Whether or not we should build this expensive port that might put us in debt to a foreign power. What country should we invest in based on projected GDP? Whether or not the Federal Reserve should raise interest rates or keep them low? And if you want to learn how it works, the best place to do so is Brilliant.org. Their statistics course makes these concepts simple because the best way to learn something is not through lectures, repetition, doing odd number exercises from a textbook. No, research has shown that the best way to learn is through problem solving. And Brilliant is a website and app built off of this very principle, that you learn best while doing and solving in real time. Get instant feedback and improve rapidly with Brilliant's active and interactive learning platform, Jump right into solving problems and be coached bit by bit until before you realize it, you've learned a fundamental concept in STEM or other subjects. There aren't any tests or grades, just pick a course you're interested in and get started, with help along the way. And Brilliant has something for everyone. Whether you want to learn the basics of math, statistics, computer science, or dive into cutting edge topics like cryptocurrency or quantum computing. If you want to join me in the community of 8 million learners and educators today, click the link in the description below or visit brilliant.org slash jaketrent to sign up for free and get 20% off. Debt Trap's debt diplomacy is nothing new. In fact, China is probably just taking a page out of the original master at this game, the US, because the similarities are shocking. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the US and US companies used these exact same strategies on countries like Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, and more. As John Perkins laid out in his infamous book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. What is an economic hitman, and what is your story as an economic hitman? Well, so Jake, let me first say that my official title was I was chief economist at a, at a major international consulting firm. 
And I had a staff and I, I, my job was really to use my staff and to, and to identify countries with resources our corporations want, like oil and minerals and such things, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money didn't go to the country. Instead, it went directly to our own corporations, U.S. corporations, to build big infrastructure projects in those countries, things like power plants and industrial parks and highways and ports that benefit first of all, our companies that made huge profits off these things. And second of all, a few wealthy families in these countries, families that, you know, typically rule the countries with an iron thumb sometimes. And, and uh, they benefited because they own the industry, they own the commercial establishments, they own the banks, they own all of that. And so more electricity, better electricity, more highways and ports, that helped them. But the problem was that the, the loans also uh, work, they were, the collateral for the loan was the resources that were still under the ground usually, like oil, that had been exported, exploited. And so the idea was that they would take on these loans and over time they would allow our, our corporations to come in and, and take their resources. In the meantime, they had to pay off interest on the loans. And so the, most of the people in the country suffered terribly. Money was diverted from education, healthcare, and other social s services to pay off the interest. So we'd go back in, usually under the guise of the International Monetary Fund policing organization, and say, okay, so you can, you're not paying off your loan, so you sell your oil real cheap to our corporations without environmental or social regulations. Let the United States build a military base on your soil, uh, privatize your, your businesses, your public sector businesses, your education system, your water and sewage systems, etc., cetera, and, and sell them to our investors cheap. Vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba or, or whatever. So it was really, it, it truly is a form, still goes on, of colonialism, but as you pointed out, typically without the military. Although the, the threat of military intervening is always sort of lurking in the background. <laughs> Why did the U.S. go through all this effort to enslave these less developed countries or LDCs? Simple. When you're a global superpower, you need a lot of resources to stay on top. Oil, energy, raw materials, places to put military bases, nations under your influence so you can call them up when you need something like votes at the UN, and so on. So what happens when a country you're going after can't pay its debts? You elaborated on it a little bit, but can you go into a little bit more detail? Ah, we're so happy. You know, we're just so happy <laughs> because the IMF goes in and restructures the loan. International it, Monetary Fund, for those that don't know. It creates what are called SAPs, Structural Adjustment Policies and Conditionalities. Watch this video to learn more about the U.S.'s debt traps. Today, China is in a similar position. They are desperate for energy, money, and resources to continue their astronomical climb to the top. China has surpassed the US on oil imports, and China gets a third of its oil from Africa, along with 20% of China's cotton. Africa has half of the world's manganese for steel production, along with a ton of other metals needed for electronics. As China's middle class grows, their cost of labor goes up. Which means that ironically, now they have to turn elsewhere for cheaper labor. Of course, having more countries side with you and not the US is always a good thing. And as Africa's 1.2 billion people urbanize at breakneck speeds, Countries willing to risk billions to build infrastructure there could be facing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make billions, maybe even trillions over the long run. And it looks like China is the only one willing to take that risk. What's happening now is, is China's coming in and offering better deals. I think the Chinese learned from the mistakes that, that Russia's economic hitmen and the United States' economic hitmen made. I don't think they're making those mistakes. They're going to make their own set of mistakes, but they're not making those. And so actually, President Xi has, has gone on record uh, as, as promising, and I've got in front of me right now the, 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 the four points that he's, he's recently made as a promise to any country where they go in. And you're quite correct that they go in and they, they bring in their own workforces, they bring in their own engineering companies, and they use resources as collateral, just as we did. But he's also promised that one, we won't interfere in other countries' internal affairs. Two, we won't impose our will on other countries in any way. Three, we won't attach political agendas to assistance programs. And four, we won't seek selfish political gains through our investment and financial policies. So China basically saw everything that the US did and Russia did that these countries didn't like, like they addressed all their pain points and basically just flipped it around and got rid of all those pain points at a cheaper price. 
Yeah. Which brings us to step one. Step number one, offer to build infrastructure. You, the Chinese government, have your state-owned corporations and banks go to these less developed countries or LDCs and offer them loans or debt to build infrastructure. If there's no existing infrastructure, you start with mines, power plants, water plants, the basics. They will inevitably say yes to all this debt because debt is like rocket fuel. If the debt is used properly to increase productivity, more jobs, more products, etc., then there's a net positive and you can scale to the moon. The politicians getting offered this rocket fuel only see this good side. But as these infrastructure projects get bigger, more complex, more expensive, and require more forecasting from experts, that same rocket fuel that can take you to the moon can also make your nation crash and burn under all this debt. The same goes for any other kind of debt like VC funding for startups. Along with that, these African countries are like Sri Lanka. These are risky, expensive infrastructure projects that may or may not be profitable, so no one else is going to fund it. These projects also look great for the local politicians because they'll look like the savers of these nations, bringing in jobs, urbanization, and so on. If you look at it from a governmental side, or from the side of politics, I would say that most uh, politicians, especially in Africa, they really like it. And lastly, this also looks great for the citizens because of those same promises of prosperity. So in a nutshell, it's an easy sell, and the countries practically always say yes. But again, you only give them the loan under the condition that it's Chinese companies that build out these projects at inflated prices. Therefore, the money goes from the state-owned banks to the LDC and then right back into the pockets of the state-owned enterprises. Most aid that the Chinese government gives, uh, there is this ratio of 70-30 approval. 70% of the project has to be handled by Chinese companies and 30% by local firms. It's a thin veil, but, but actually what usually happens is the U.S. government through USAID or one of its agencies gives the loan to the country and the country hires us. Yeah, that's what I found really clever was you're giving foreign aid, which looks and sounds really generous and helpful and altruistic, but then the money goes straight back into U.S. companies and U.S. contractors. So the country you're trying to help just ends up with debt and an infrastructure project that may or may not be profitable. Am I getting that correctly? Yes, and the infrastructure project probably is profitable for the wealthy families. If the project ends up being profitable, everyone wins. If it underperforms like Sri Lanka, you have more leverage over these nations. Almost all aids of financial assistance that China gives to Africa has been backed or has to be backed by natural resources. Most countries have been in situations where because they couldn't pay, it authorizes automatically the Chinese government to step into the country and then take all these natural resources which they use as collateral. Either way, this country will be under your influence. Step number two, expand. Once these basic infrastructure projects like mines and power plants are up, they're going to need other infrastructure like roads, ports, trains, power lines, telecom to support these mines and power plants. So rinse and repeat the process for those projects, getting the countries more and more in debt. Step number three, cheap labor. Now that you have the basic building blocks of an urbanized economy, you can use Africa as China's new China for cheap labor. Think basic, low-value-add manufacturing for shoes, textiles, and other basic products that require a lot of labor. Step number four, more expansion. That cheap labor will have to live, shop, and eat somewhere, so they'll turn to you for even more infrastructure, this time in the form of residential and commercial buildings. Step number five, sit back, relax, because now you basically have complete control. If all goes according to plan, you, China, will have your fingers in all aspects of Africa's economy the fastest growing region in the world, from every segment of the infrastructure to the continent's debt. When you look at Africa today, this is pretty much exactly what has gone down. In 2009, China surpassed the US as Africa's largest trading partner at around $200 billion per year. Africa exports around 15% of their goods to China, think raw materials like fuel, lubricants, iron ore, metals, and Africa imports 14 to 21% of goods from China. Think more advanced stuff like machinery, transportation, telecom equipment, and so on. So they have a very productive relationship. China has invested a staggering $300 billion in Africa. That $300 billion has funded 40% of all infrastructure projects that have been happening over there. With the help of over 10,000 Chinese companies operating in Africa, valued at over $2 trillion. Or in other words, China practically has a monopoly on all the construction going on over there. 
Any construction project you see in Africa that is higher than 3 stories or longer than 3 kilometers in terms of roads is probably being done by Chinese companies. The reason is simple. One, it's written into the loan. And two, African contractors don't have the capacity for huge construction projects. And Chinese firms undercut Western firms on price. There's the $3.2 billion, 290 mile long railway in Kenya, the largest infrastructure project in the country. There's the $3.5 billion, 470 mile electric railway in Ethiopia that became engulfed in corruption. There's another light rail system in Ethiopia funded, built, and operated by China. And suspiciously, one of the countries that was highly vulnerable to debt distress, Djibouti, which had debt swelling from 50 to 85% in just two years, gets the honor of hosting China's first overseas military base. But I'm sure it was just a coincidence. There are a ton of other projects as well. And the results? Cracks have started to show. The Ethiopia light rail ended up consuming a quarter of Ethiopia's 2016 budget. Nigeria had to renegotiate its deal with Chinese contractors because it couldn't pay up. Kenya's railway went four times over the original budget or 6% of its GDP. And in 2012 alone, the IMF found that China owned 15% of Africa's external debt. And by 2015, two thirds or 66% of all new loans were coming from China. So right now the debt is still manageable, but it all depends on how profitable these infrastructure projects end up being and how much more debt, how much more rocket fuel these countries take on in the future. Do you think they're using the same tactics of, you know, questionable <laughs> studies, manipulating the statistics that you talked about in your book? Well, let me give a couple of examples of the terrible mistakes that China's made. So, and, and I'll go back to Ecuador, uh, a country that I know well, but it's a, it's a, I, in a book I'm writing now, I call Ecuador the, the canary in China's cage because I think it serves as a warning. They built a huge hydroelectric plant there that was supposed to serve more than 30% of the country's capacity, mm. the biggest hydroelectric plant ever built. And they built it on a fault line next to an active volcano in a very sensitive ecosystem in the rainforest. As for politics, there's actual evidence that Chinese debt has had an effect. A study by Aid Data found that if an African country recognizes Taiwan as a country, they get on average 2.7 fewer infrastructure projects per year. If an African nation happens to cast the same votes as China in the United Nations, they'll get on average 1.8 more infrastructure projects per year. And this is just one stat that shows the influence of Chinese debt that we're able to quantify. On the other side of the story, when you look at these African countries, the majority of them actually happily welcome Chinese investment, which is understandable. Okay. And China's done more in Africa than anywhere. I don't care. You can say UK, America, Germany, yeah. British. You can, I don't care who you call. No one's done more work in China to benefit Africans than, I, I, than the Chinese. They've been very clear that they're about trade and that they're not about influencing a country's policies. We were very clear that we wanted to influence countries' policies. Africa saw China's astronomical growth from very similar humble beginnings in the 1900s, and they hope that they can replicate China's success. China, we developed, that's the other thing, that they can show over 30 years, they had economic growth of more than 10%. That's never happened before in history at least in any history that any of us can find. And, you know, they got rid of 800, they, they, they brought 800 million people out of poverty, which is more than the whole rest of the world combined. The infrastructure has had a net positive on African countries in terms of living standards, jobs, and so forth. And Chinese infrastructure is also cheaper than Western construction with, on the surface, less strings attached. With Chinese assistance, it's a long, it gives a long-term payback, which most Africans enjoy. And also, the West do not give a long-term payback. So most, most Africans are kind of like locked in with that and they prefer that. Politicians don't have to worry about the U.S. shoving democracy down their throats. We would much rather take loans and aid from China than the United States because they don't make these demands on us. And they've never assassinated one of our leaders. But as the former governor of Nigeria's central bank said, we must see China for what it is, a competitor. Africa must recognize that China, like the US, Russia, Britain, Brazil, and the rest, is in Africa not for African interests, but its own. I think the relationship between Africa and the Chinese government is probably a lot like the relationship between the Chinese government and Chinese entrepreneurs. As long as you're moving in the same direction as their agenda, all is well. But as soon as you step out of line, the sickle comes down. 
The challenge is when they start to see that that entrepreneur is a threat to the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, then they can be taken down a notch. And so in the meantime, those entrepreneurs are richly rewarded by having preferential treatment from the government in terms of rules and regulations, but also access to capital. And the motivation is I can get really, really wealthy and maybe I can get really, really wealthy. I can establish a nest egg outside the country and maybe I can actually leave the country as many have. So they've, they've moved their assets out, they've gotten rich and then they've, they've escaped China. So what do you think of China's involvement in the region? The same country where re-education camps disappearing billionaires like Jack Ma, Hong Kong, Taiwan and a whole host of other problems has perfect win-win relationships with these countries with no ulterior motives? That is up for you to decide. But I personally wouldn't put my money on it. You know, they make a matrix and they, they, they make the comparison. China comes out looking pretty good to them. And who knows in the long run what will happen. Americans believe that China has the same objectives as the U.S. and Russia did during the Cold War. That there's this animosity to dominate the world. In her opinion, China doesn't have that, that goal. It does want to dominate trade and commerce, but it's not trying to dominate militarily. However, Having said that, of course, we have to look at what's going on in Hong Kong, Myanmar, and Taiwan, and the South China Sea, and Tibet. So China certainly has, has the ability to be very aggressive when it wants to. China probably is going to kind of follow the old model. But on the other hand, we've also seen throughout history there have been times when things have radically changed. China certainly is making mistakes and, and yet it continues to sell these projects in the same way. It's been a little over a year since the original video I made on enslaving third world countries through debt came out, so I thought that this would be a very appropriate time to make this follow-up video. Don't forget that this video is sponsored by Brilliance. Whenever there's a new breakthrough or innovation in the STEM fields, like quantum computing for example, I'll usually just go on Brilliant to get an understanding of how everything works behind the scenes because I know that I'm going to get a very simple explanation all in one place. So invest in yourself and support the brands that help make this channel possible by going to brilliant.org slash jaketran to sign up for free and for 20% off. Link below. You can check out the full interview I did with John Perkins, the author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman with the link below. One of my favorite interviews I've done so far, John is a super genuine guy with like a whole wealth of knowledge. If you like this video, you're definitely going to enjoy the full interview too and that will be linked below. You can also connect with John at johnperkins.org and check out his book with the links below. If you are new here, subscribe because it's free and we make video essays like this on the most provocative stuff in the world of business every single week for free. Red button below. That is going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome. I've been Jake. Stay dangerous out there and I'll see you guys in the next one.